Everyday Juggler, your source for juggling highlights, interviews, tutorials, and reviews. And now your host, Sean Livingston. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out this edition of Everyday Juggler Profiles. Today we get to hang out with David Nair. David, thanks for hanging out with us today. Hi, thanks for inviting me. I'm delighted to talk about juggling. David has been juggling for over 40 years. He has been involved with clubs and festivals. He's been performing, and he really loves to do force bounce juggling, but that's not all he can do. David, I, you have a few records. Could you tell us about a few of those and also fill us in on anything I missed? Um, yeah, for me, juggling has... I, I, I spend time in three different areas of juggling. The force bounce records is part of what I would call sort of sport juggling or trying to break records juggling. Uh, I've been force bouncing since the early 70s. Um, my inspiration and mentor for bouncing was Paul Bachman, who just died this year. Uh, for me, a really important guy in terms of my own juggling. Uh, the first time I saw bounce juggling, he was he showed me a six-ball force bounce standing on a stool on a wooden floor with you know lacrosse balls that barely bounced um, in his collection with all sorts of other interesting toys and props. Um, um, the force bouncing is one of the signature things, you know, if you, if you look for me, you'll usually see me something around a force bounce. Um, I had my first seven ball force bounce pattern back in the 1980s, 1984, I had a 286 catch seven ball force bounce, which for me was unique in the world at that time. Mm -hmm. um, in 1984, think, that wasn't really a thing. Oh, well, um, Frank Facchini, who made, you know, it was the... The, the, the great Fakini silicone juggling, the original silicone bounce juggling ball. Um, I, I forgot Frank's uh, real last name, um, but he was a molder for, I think, um, uh, an industrial molding company. And um, he made magic props, but he also made these beautiful silicone balls, the first invention of those. And I still have a set of them. Hmm. I, think they, I, I believe they deserve to go into a museum. <laughs> They're a little dented with time. Um, but, I'm, sure, yeah, that's, I'm sure David that's, Kane would love you to send those to him. Yeah, that's the that's sort of the beginning of, uh, of of bounce juggling balls that really had some bounce, and they were in the high 80s in terms of elastic rebound. We can talk about props also. Um, uh, and so developing a seven ball force bounce required a ball with enough um, um, bounce in it and, um, you know, building all the pieces around it. Um, I remember when I... Um, when I first broke that minute mark, which was my goal, um, uh, the first thing I did was call Paul, Paul Bachman up and say, hey, I did this. What do you think? Is there anybody else in the world who does that? He said, not that I know of. You know, For me, that was sort of officially declaring that was the world record. Um, <laughs> and I don't think anybody else ever did anything around that um, until probably the late 90s. Um, and uh, I don't. I think it was the de facto record for about 20 years or so. I continued to bounce, juggle, and do other things, um, but in terms of an official record, I would say that was the first one. All you right. tell me what else is interesting for you. Say that again. What else would be interesting? I'm happy to talk about uh, whatever you want. Well, you talked about how Paul Bachman was your inspiration. I was just wondering if you'd share a little bit more about that story. Um, Paul, um, there were uh, three, four of us in Chicago. Um, who had formed a club around the University of Chicago. I was still 14, 15 years old, so I was in the high school associated with the university. Um, and uh, we found Paul Bachman. I don't remember exactly how one of the members did, and uh, invited him down to the campus area to juggle with us, show his films. And then, you know, if, if anybody who ever knew Paul, Paul never traveled with just his props. He always traveled with a whole bunch of other interesting historical stuff. And even in the 70s, he would still bring a um, a um, Super 8 or a, or a 16 millimeter film projector. Um, so Juggling Club was as much look at interesting black and white film mm -hmm. um, uh, of other jugglers and look at props. So he had he had vaudeville area um, clubs and um, clubs made out of cork and. Uh, um, he had his little tiny bicycles, bic you know, bicycles with like four-inch wheels. I think he had at one point the world's smallest bicycle, which was part of huh. his part of his act. So he had this sort of big guy, mid big middle-aged guy at those point. I think he was in his forties. Mm -hmm. um, uh, would run around on this tiny little bicycle and, in general, be sort of a fool. Really funny, entertaining, comedic guy. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, that's the first 
bounce juggling pattern I saw. He did both lift and force bouncing, but I was always interested in force bouncing, and I and that's the first six ball force bounce pattern I ever saw, which was a, I think a um, simultaneous one ball crossed in front of the other, in two parallel rows. Left, mm. I think, right hand in front of the left hand. My six ball force bounce is a wimpy pattern, which I I think I developed a little differently than his. Um, that's okay. We'll never know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, he 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 came down probably three four times a year for a couple of years and was the um, this the um, sort of the the most interesting seed for us at the uni- at the university that time. So you basically just got to hang out with him whenever he came down. Yeah, that's that was it. It was <laughs> was it was juggling in Iden Ice Hall. In, I don't know um, for for me and and probably some others like that read about these jugglers of the past. You know, like he's sort of. You know, he's one of the greats, right? He's he's somebody everybody knows. And so I, I I consider myself in his direct lineage. Yeah. I became a juggler because of him. Um so uh I, you know, and also, you know, a few thousand hours of practice. <laughs> uh, for <laughs> me my you? estimate now is around eighteen thousand eighteen thousand to twenty thousand hours of juggling practice is what I have in me. Wow. Um wow. so I slowed down from earlier years. Um, so Paul got you started and uh then what kept you going? Um, I, I like, I like performing, you know, um, aside from the sport juggling piece, I really, I'm still performing. I have, I have a performing partner that I do gigs with here. Um, I started, um, uh, doing shows out on the street. I must've been 15, 16 years old. Uh, I have a photograph of me at the Wooded Island Festival in Chicago in August of, two, of 1977. Um, you know, doing uh, my three ball routine. Uh, it was interesting. Um, when I looked at some of, the, there's a little video piece of Paul Bachman's three ball routine. And hell, if I look at it and I say, gosh, um, again, I can see how touched I am. There's five or six little sequences in my standard three ball routine, which I've done for decades, which are, you know, direct Paul Bachman influence. Mm. It's just that do something in the pattern, be totally surprised by it. Uh, the pattern has a life of its own, uh, and there's a dialogue between the pattern and you, and it's it's exactly all of the you know it's 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 Paul Bachman inspired. You definitely know that's that's mm-hmm. what I do, um, and that's something you you do instinctively. Yeah, the um, the faces and the level of animation I have in in my face when I express myself performing that's that became me. Mm-hmm. That's that's my style, but again inspired by it's not it's not a um, you know, an, an Ignatov style of performing. That's one of one of the things that Paul brought down was he had he had been out to the Moscow Circus. He had film of Ignatov performing five you know five club back crosses in his nine ring pattern mm. um, in the period before he had actually. And I think we saw an eleven ring flash in training. I think that was the big big deal on on. And this is seedy little film badly lit in a circus setting. Um, um, but you know, very, that's a very different style. That's circus performing. There's no humor in it. Um, you can't really see the face of the performer. You can see the size of mm-hmm. the, his object mm-hmm. meant to be 20 feet away. Um, I I supported myself in college. So you know, you go 19 from 1978, 19 through 1981. Um, I supported myself by street performing. Wow. Um, wow! I spent in that three year ban. I spent a year in India actually as a linguistics and South Asian studies student in India, I wrote uh, anthropology papers on performers and nomadic tribes performing there. How did I do that? Well, I had my juggling gear with me, um, get out on the street and perform, and um, if you could make enough attention, uh, you could actually get, I got the attention of the street performing tribes to actually include me in their act. You know, a, a foreigner or a Videshi would be willing to uh, create attention, certainly right. work for them. Um, Interesting little period for me, um, but again, that that was that was monkey trainers and snake charmers and magicians in India um, from nomadic tribes, which are actually outside of the caste system, who travel okay. across the north side. You know, true street performers. If that you want to learn so street cool. performing, that's real. That's real street performing for you. They speak their own code language and dialogue. I was a linguistic student, so I was also interested in their oh, okay. language. I was um, a linguistic student as well. Just fun fact. So. So they um, they have a Creole and a code language because they're used to they so they speak several of the North Indic dialects, 
but they also speak their own code language, very much the way um, you you see uh, Carney people here have their own code language for what's going on in the show. Mm -hmm. uh, you want you want to know who's who's the guy who's actually going to give you money and who's the guy who's not right. when it's time right. to move on and when, where the cops are or whatever, all that important stuff for street performing. Um, uh, I continued to perform in the 80s. I did, um, I did shows off and on, but I've always had another parallel career, which was usually technology-based. I was originally a mathematician uh, and then did applied math, and I have degree, uh, this degree in South Asian Studies and Linguistics because I went to India, but I also have an, an, an MBA, uh, and I did um, operations consulting, and I was a management consulting consultant and did instructions of companies. But I always did it with something, and if you know, if you know, so I'll mention Paul Bachman again. I guess I'm just a fan. Um, he always had a parallel career as well, so mm -hmm. and he would differentiate himself as you know that wasn't his full time thing. He did, he was a uh, a professional in the um, you know in the energy business. I think he worked for Standard Oil when I knew him. Okay. Um, while Standard Oil still existed before it was merged into Amoco, and the Amoco building became another building, and all et cetera, um, and so it was always what you, what you did for a living and what you did for joy, which was juggling and performing. Right. So, so far, you, you've told us that you, you were inspired by Paul Bachman. You got to hang out with him. Uh, yeah. Then you went for a semester abroad to India, and you got to hang out with I, what I'm, I'm kind of picturing the Indian version of, like, gypsies, you know? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's very much... So nomadic street performers, right? We imagine we imagine gypsies because they, you know, they were nomadic, and you know, you you take a population and you don't give them a place to a legal place to live. Mm -hmm. Everywhere they went from town to town, they were usually on the outskirts of town because nobody wanted them around, right? So that's that. It's that. It's that style of uh, well, you know, we have a Syrian refugee problem right now. Um, you you you. You know, you, people need a place to live, or or they develop a solution that works for that. For them, they were performers. Mm -hmm. um, they came from populations that did other things like rope making. In, in in India, different um, groups will have their own trades. They came from rope makers and carvers and and potters and things like that. And you, know, you can you can track that linguistically from where they came from. Mm, different that's... different story, different time. Yeah. Uh, well, th these are some really cool experiences. I'm excited to just keep on listening to your yeah. juggling experiences. Um, you've already told us that you were part of this club in, at university, and, and then when you went abroad, you had a, a trope that you uh, got to juggle with. Uh, you've been involved with the club since then? Uh, yeah, I, I moved to Texas, Austin, Texas, and I'll be specific, Austin, which is you know, I, most people identify themselves with Austin, not necessarily with Texas. Um, uh, in 1993, to do to do uh, to do work with Dell, I was invited as part of um, a, a restructuring and redesign of Dell to join Dell. And um, I, uh, and a couple of years later, I joined the Texas Juggling Society, which is the main juggling club here in Austin. Uh, incidentally, the club which is hosting. The next IJA, um, which will be, uh, while not in Austin, it'll be set up in, I think, El Paso, um, but it's it's our club that's doing the logistics for it. Um, and we've had a juggling festival here in Austin. I think we're now on our coming up on our 23rd year of a festival. And I've been part of the festival, I think, for 18. Okay. Would you uh, say... To go actually to go back to the theme, the three areas of juggling that I do, there's sort of sport juggling and records, there's performing, and there's teaching. Um, the teaching side of it, um, my contribution originally to the festival here was to help organize the workshops okay. um, and mature the workshop part. Of it. Well, let's talk a little bit about more about that. Your, the three three parts of juggling that, that you see. Um, one is teaching, and so you worked with the workshops, the festival. How else have you exercised? Yeah, for that? me, there's sort of three different mindsets, brains. Um, so I, I also I have a, a daughter who is now 20 and a sophomore in college. Um, but at some point in her life, she was in Montessori school, um, and I had an invitation into that Montessori school to support um, something more than their traditional recess, going out and playing outside without any structure, and I contributed a, a curriculum around juggling for little kids. Um, 
that which evolved into about a 500 lesson Montessori full blown Montessori curriculum for juggling, from um, 18 month old through um, the end of the in the U.S. the Montessori curriculum goes through about eighth grade. There's a there's a couple of programs that run a little bit longer than that, but that's fairly rare here. Hmm. Um, and um, you, you said from 18 months. From 18 months, yes. So um, one of the schools that I got to work with just recently cha uh, changed is in my neighborhood here. Um, had uh, so Montessori has typically three-year bands. There's a there's a zero to 18 month and an 18 month to three year that they divide because there's a pretty big difference in the the the, the beginning of that. Um, and then typically you go th three three to six year old, six to nine, nine to twelve. These are bands of um, cognitive development. Um, and Maria Montessori was quite visionary, knowing this more than a hundred years ago, before other people came along and said, "Hey, she's right." Um, um, and I, so I've worked with those classrooms and the teachers, um, bringing in material with balls or other objects, so that kids can learn um, equilibristic type work. Um, and um, the the trick to teaching juggling is to find the perfect lesson for the person who's in front of you, whatever their skills are, whatever their interests are, whatever their talents are that they bring. So, um, you know, if you have, um, like my current performing partner is a professional ballet dancer, guess what? He's pretty good at pirouettes. Um, he's pretty good at jumping. Um, he's pretty good at knowing where you are if you're doing, um, you know, um, pair on, you know, one-on-one -on -one passing stuff. So we do real close physical stuff. He's a, he's the perfect guy to develop that material with. That's his, he had a really good background. I would tell you, Ian is really good at training a skill, which is, I distinguish in learning between complexity and skill. So a skill is, can I do this thing really reliably and accurately? Can I, you know, so if, if you, if you like, uh, I'll, as an example, if I give him instruction to stand up straighter and lower his arms, well, gosh, as a you know somebody who spent all that time uh, dancing, he 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 he'll take that instruction and just do it, know how to do it. If I if I gave that to the average numbers juggler who's been focusing on their patterns, they're not necessarily aware of where their body is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it would be a different lesson. There, I might tell a numbers juggler trying to perfect his eight ball fountain pattern. Um, to um, drop his arms more and bring his elbows back to bring the pattern in closer to himself. He's looking at the balls instead of realizing where his body is underneath it. Mm. Um, so to go back to the Montessori curriculum, there are things that an 18-month-old can learn that's part of juggling. Mm. I actually have a video of me with a circle of 10 18-month-old kids who learn to keep their hands in front of their belly and wait for, I have a a John Nord, I'm going to plug John Nord, who's my favorite beanbag maker. Um, I have a John Nord four and a half inch ball, which weighs a pound. Wow. Okay. It's a beanbag that lands. Um, so I juggled um, three of these beanbags, and each one of the kids had their own. And I trained this compadre of 18 month to th three year olds how to catch that ball and how to throw it back or roll it back to me. And we have a circle of all of us passing. Um, That's incredible. You know, yeah, we're really pretty remarkable what you can do. And um, with with the really young kids, my favorite way to teach juggling is you sit uh, on the on the floor, feet to feet, making a uh, closed space with your feet between you, mm -hmm. and you roll balls back and forth, very much like a bounce juggling mm -hmm. pattern. But this is a rolling pattern, and you can do circle rolling and you can get three, four, five balls going and there's all of this activity, it's all involving, it's um, the ball comes in, the ball goes out, that's mm -hmm. all they need to learn and mm -hmm. then you try and systemize that. Yep. Um, the lessons get much more complicated if you go to a five, six, seven year old. Um, what I really like about bounce juggling is the ball terminates at the top where you catch it at its slowest speed and you know exactly where the ball is. There's a column between you and the, and the floor that you can stand over and you can see the whole ball. So if you want to work with somebody who's just really learning to catch and drop and do that timing, it's a beautiful thing to learn for kids. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get five and six year olds passing four balls between each other by simultaneous left hand bounces to your right hand, right hand bounces to your partner and vice versa. You mm -hmm. can get that pattern up and going and they're all juggling and it's cool. Yeah. And yeah. then they're in. Um, uh, in a, a three ball bouncing pattern rolling on the floor against the uh, against a wall, you can mm -hmm. get a three ball rolled cascade 
for a four or five year old. Hmm. Um, and all of this is precursors to getting balls loose in the air and passing in the air. It sounds like we uh, could probably all benefit from from going yeah. through this. Yeah, and Starting you know, I the basics. One of my favorite videos, of course, is Anthony Gatto, nine years old, uh, um, at the um, you know at, at, in the circus ring with his five clubs and his seven balls and uh, you know his back crosses. Um, um, by the time kids are six, seven, eight, nine years old, they're, they're juggling, you can get them all juggling. As mm -hmm. long as everyone gets to work on something that fits where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, it's another piece of it. Um, I'm That's a fan. A really interesting of, concept that I haven't put much thought into that kind of we're almost made or, you know, we are, we, we each in our own ways are meant to do a certain kind of juggling. We're each unique. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I, I, you know, you and I could spend some time together. I'll find the thing that you are, that is you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some, some, some fraction of people are intrinsically kinesthetic. They learn by touch. Um, hand them a contact ball. Um, put them on a hula hoop. They probably could stand on a, on a roll of bola. Mm -hmm. um, I, had a, I had a student who, um, um, her, le her left arm ended at the elbow, uh, her, and her right arm had only half a hand. Um, what are you going to do for juggling? Guess what? She's really good at balancing. She, all her life, she's been picking up stuff. This was a high school student. She'd been picking up stuff, and she has to learn to balance and engage, engage the world with that. You know, that's what her limbs are. That's the way she is. Um, and um, she, I, uh, you know, I appreciate that she signed up for a, a, a juggling class that I had at a high school that I was supporting. Um, and it um, took me a little while to figure out what are we going to do for developing her. I got her balancing stuff on her head and her face, um, and she was really good at it. It was, <laughs> okay, no problem. We got something for her to do. Let's do ba balancing. You know, stand on one leg, balance something on your head. Um, um, we, you know, we're, we each have something. Um, turns out I'm pretty good at rhythm. Um, you had in you know, your post last week or um, that... Um, uh, we can get into the fractional pattern question. I'm I'm pretty good at rhythm. I always have been. I sang. One of the things that I did um, from about uh, age 13 onward was sing, mm -hmm. uh, and I have been a part of choirs. Um, so um, um, classical music choir. And uh, in my 20s, I was sang as part of Gilbert and Sullivan, but not as a soloist. I'm a choral member. I like okay. again. I like collaboration. I'd lo I'd love to sing with other voices. Right. Um, I have buddies from my high school age who went on to become, you know, uh, singer-songwriters, and here I am in Austin with more singers, uh, <laughs> lots of music around. Um, but I also I'm pretty darn good at rhythm. My father was a, um, a quite an excellent musician, was a um, woodwind player. Um, uh, so I grew up around classical music. Not, not you know, it's another piece of that nerdy thing that contributes to jugglers. You'll find a lot of jugglers have that have musical talent as well. Um, bound. Yes, there, there you go. I see your hand going up. So in bounce juggling, um, unlike toss juggling, the vertical dimension is fixed. The height you are off the ground, you can vary it a little bit, but it has to be within what homeostasis of your throwing, um, you know, arrangement is. So you tend, you tend to have a very finite rhythm sequence. It really is determined, you know, how mm -hmm. how high that ball travels has a lot to do with what the rhythm is. You can put right, a little right. bit of extra juice on it to make it a little bit faster, but then the reaction coming back is a higher bounce. It takes it out of equilibrium. So part of excellence in bounce juggling is excellence in rhythm accuracy. And that seven ball force bounce pattern that I do, I've measured it, and really the tolerance is about three thousandths of a second. Okay? So if you hear a, a drummer within three thousandths of a second, you'll hear him as a good drummer. You hear him outside of that. You'll hear not as not so accurate drummer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a bass player that misses the beat by three thousandths of a second probably won't notice it mm -hmm. because it's a long enough pluck. But you know, that's that's the kind of tolerances we're talking about to get a seven ball force bounce pattern. If you're out of that tolerance, then you're going to have a collision. Mm -hmm. Now, in in a toss juggling pattern, you uh, typically a juggler, if you study them, they'll either bring a, a ball out of plane slightly. And they'll certainly correct in height. So if you have a ball land late, they'll 
the, the right correction is to throw it a little bit lower back into the pattern. Mm -hmm. And you'll see that. And it takes a while. It's not necessarily something that jugglers are doing consciously, but that's the way right. they keep homeostasis in the pattern. You have height as a variation. Um, and you don't have a reaction off of, the, off of the sky from the ball coming back, so you can take it out of plane. If I take my ball out of plane too far in my bounce juggling pattern, it picks up a spin which actually um, works against its location. Hmm. So it's really valuable to be in plane. It's really important to be on beat. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to match heights correctly because you don't have a lot of time in the throwing pattern. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's actually a shallower scoop. You know, mm -hmm. The wax on hand position that you have in a, in a, juggle, in a toss juggling hand, you have in a bounce pattern as well, but it's a little bit shorter. Mm -hmm. If you look at my video, my seven ball bounce pattern, you'll see I'm really orbiting around my elbows. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you correct a pattern in a bounce juggling pattern? Now, I, what I'm telling you is the bad news is you have to somehow get a ball that's late back into the pattern on time without putting too much juice on it that you exaggerate it being late by going too high. Mm -hmm. So it's counterintuitive. Yeah, that's what it's that timing criticality that you have to learn in order to sing, yep. sustain a bounce pattern. So a one of the things I've, I've this is go ahead. I'm sorry. Lift pattern you can actually vary the height a little. A force pattern you can is between you and the ground. Right. That's why I believe force is it, force is faster, and force is also harder to correct. Um, that's, one of the things you know, that I read online um, in preparation for this is is there, like I read a couple different articles like it's generally agreed that force bounce juggling is easier than toss juggling and but correct. watching watching your videos I didn't I, I just was like I don't think so so no, you, actually, you do both so what do you think I, I would tell you um, lift bounce juggling so that the, the, the juggle wiki I think needs a little correction um, generally lift um, bounce juggling patterns are easier than tossing patterns but that is because you're including lift bounce patterns. Lift bounce patterns are slower than toss patterns, um, and they have generally a fairly low toss, so that the skill of where you throw them, I think, is easier than the, you know, to throw a seven lift is about a, between a three and a four in difficulty of a toss of a tossed ball in terms of um, accuracy. Now there is a little bit of timing. It's it's a faster timing issue, but I'll tell you mm -hmm. a seven ball lift bounce pattern is easier than a seven ball toss pattern. Okay. I do not believe that is true of a force bounce pattern. Got it. I believe a force bounce pattern is harder than a, than a toss pattern. Mm -hmm. I do both. Um, one of the things you can find is um, there's sort of um, th three areas that I'm, I've really been working on the learning edge, the hat stealing pattern. Well, we can come back to that. Um, um, bounce juggling, which is for me primarily force bouncing because that's the area that I like. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I do a lot of numbers passing. Mm -hmm. um, so I've passed 10 clubs. I passed 10 clubs probably 15 years ago when 10 clubs was, was something to do. Um, I've, um, I, one of my training and performing partners, uh, Zach Wagner, um, I do numbers passing with. And, um, um, we pass 12 balls. We, you know, we qualify a 12 ball two count pattern. Um, uh, again, that requires a partner who, who's willing to work with you. I think it's a little more technical than you each doing six because you have a pattern that you don't control all the outcomes of and right. you don't necessarily get to see the landing. I think tossing, passing is harder than self patterns. Um, the, I believe a force bounce pattern is a good 10, 15% harder than a toss, tossing pattern. Mm -hmm. I think that's the reason that you see, um, for force bouncing that the numbers have not been there and that it's mm -hmm. it's hard to learn aside from being technical. I, right. You know, I was telling you the difficulty of correcting a force bounce pattern. Another another issue with for, with bounce juggling is the balls run away. You know, there are you're not juggling with bean bags, you're juggling with a ballistic object that will find the lowest point in the room and hide from you. Right. Um, so, you know, you need to set up the right conditions, you need the right floor. Um, there's a, there are about 40 variables I worked on in order to work on my world record. We can talk about that too if you want, but there's things like I care about the temperature of the ball. I care about the temperature of the floor. Oh, wow. I care about my warm-up. I care about the height. I care about the lighting conditions. I care about if, if the, the space where you see all my records is a, is a space that I've worked on for several years. I'm on the part of the floor which is domed and slightly higher than the rest of the floor. Huh. When I drop the balls, they roll away. 
I have on, on the wall next to me a bag with 29 balls in it so I can be up on that 42 inch high platform and run okay. patterns, take a break without getting down and getting... You know, getting well, down. but the risk of that is I was watching one video of one of your records and a, a ball from a past run Rolls Whoa. right by, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I'm, there's, there's before you start, um, that's one of the other uh, skills you develop as a bounce juggler. Uh, before you start, you look around and you have this intuitive read of who all the li- you know, where all the live objects in the room are and are they going to interfere with you or not. It's, it's pretty rare that a ball, that I've missed it and a ball comes through my pattern. Um, with my seven ball force now, I can steer it enough that I can. I think I can miss it if it's if it's moving slow enough. I can miss it, mm-hmm. but it is really pretty distracting if you're going for a record. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there there's another piece of it. I'm I actually count during my records. So mm-hmm. my uh, my five ball force bounce record, which is an hour and eleven minutes and seven seconds. You know, seventy one minutes. I actually counted the damn thing. It's in the seventeen thousand range. Um, Wait, once you're we got you over, count each, each I counted. The, I, I'm, I'm counting. So with that pattern, I have a single tracer ball that I'm counting. I'm basically counting in tens. In the tens, I visualize. Uh, so some of it I'm audibly counting in my head, or at least acoustically in my head without speaking. I keep a, a visual um, larger digit. Is my way of managing the complexity. Mm-hmm. Um, around uh, an hour and so five minutes or so, I started having conversations about where we were in order to um, close up because it, w- it was at a uh, it was at our festival here. Um, so I actually lost count, mm. uh, uh, which was which was okay because I had a time track. But it's my way of okay. having a sense of where you are. Right? Yeah. It's like um, um, with the set with. The seven ball and six ball, I'm counting them to know how close I am to the record. Benefit is I know when I break a record. Disadvantage is there really is a choke factor. Um, mm. I get damn nervous when I get close to doing something I've never done before. As to whether it's a world record or not, that's it's a different sort of mm-hmm. piece of pressure. But for me, it's just my goal is to improve. Um, and when I'm about to do something unique, I get a little bit anxious. Mm-hmm. I am always way better in front of an audience. That anxiety goes away, huh. and I'm just into entertaining the audience. Um, if only I, audiences were entertained by hours of the same yeah. pattern on end. <laughs> well, my my records are done at the uh, Texas Juggling Society meeting. Uh, um, whenever there are people around watching, I'm I actually pay more attention. Um, it, it's. You know, I, I would tell you roughly 10% of jugglers that I've seen, you know, it depends, are, are really are rhythm-focused and musician-focused. And you can see them. You, you know, I, you can spot them. Like Victor Keys came to the club. You could see he's rhythm-centered. Um, there are other people who are object and visual-centered. Hmm. It's a lot of jugglers that are that way. But rhythm focus is a little bit different. And I would tell you about 10% of jugglers that I've seen and performers, and I, I've also seen this in the classical guitar world, which is, I have buddies in the classical guitar world, when they're in front of an audience, they do better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm delighted, I, my performing partner, Ian, uh, you, you can see the two of us are playing around practicing, and then somebody, somebody stops by and says, you know, show us your stuff, suddenly we're a notch better. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're paying attention. Um, and it's just sort of that that extra kick out of performing, and, yeah. I, and you know, for him, I you know, I can I I I I um, um, I I'm fortunate enough to get uh, an occasional ticket or two to go see the Austin Ballet perform. You can see him; he's on stage; he's in his element. It's like okay, um, um, so that that's a little bit extra kick. That that five ball record, which went on for more than an hour, was at a festival. It was concurrent with the five ball duration game that they were doing. Okay. Um, uh, a couple of years prior, I had, you know, destroyed that with a five ball bounce pattern, um, which to me was, they recognized it as part of the competition, but for me it wasn't, you know, it, 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 it wasn't, uh, you know, why not do my own thing while they do it? So I started with the five ball competition, but I did in my own little corner where you'll see the record running. And then I continued because I was trying to go for uh, the hour plus mark. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no way I'd do that on my own in a little hallway with a video right. camera. I just, it, I just couldn't get the focus together. Mm-hmm. I'd much rather have people coming along cheering or doing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one of the things you mentioned about the 
the rhythm you said you said you know depending on how how tall you are really like you you've got the rhythm that you've got um is there right. you said you can throw a little harder but then it, it comes up higher so is there like some like there is down a, or there is a fairly fixed time rate mm-hmm. depending upon how high your hand is when you release so i'm on a 42 inch platform my throw height is roughly 41 inches above that so i'm you know, I you know, it might be forty. So I work between eighty two and eighty three inches off the ground. Okay. That sets a timing. The number of balls you fill into that pattern, it's just that much faster. Mm-hmm. So if you do a sight swap of um um like uh, I'll I'll pick one seven 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 two. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so that's 28 and 2, it adds up to 30, it's 5 long, it's a 6 ball pattern. What is that? Well, it's right, left, right, left, pause, left, right, left, right, pause, right, left, right, left, pause, mm-hmm. right? So from a bounce juggling pattern, it's, you, can, you can throw in the main um, number, you know, the 7 or the 6 or the 5. Mm-hmm. You can add 2s, you can add zeros, and you can probably get a 1 across the top. Okay. And that's it for side swaps. I'm not going to do a five seven, you know, seven five three one, bounce juggling. You, right. It, right. If you were going to do that, it would be some weird combination of a toss and a bounce. And and there are versions of it. David, yeah. David Kane does, you know, you, what I would call mix toss bounce. I see. Hat. Um, I do um, um, seven seven two seven two seven one two, which is. The, it, the four ball version of the baby juggling pattern, which is three balls up and a ball across, right? But I do it force bounce. So it's right, 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 and then left over the top as a toss pattern. And mm-hmm. then left, 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 left. The three bouncy balls are bouncing, and then the thing that's going across the top is whatever you want. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I don't know if you know Drew Brown, the, the cane juggler, definitely recommended... Please interview him. He's a really interesting, cool guy. What he's done to contribute to the intersection of cane and step and cane dancing and juggling Mm -hmm. is really super cool, very interesting for your audience. Um, He shot a video with about, I don't know now, 300 people, the the best of all the jugglers all over the world, doing something with a damn cane in it, right? Mm -hmm. For him, I did the five ball version of that. Now I'm up on a 42-inch platform. I have four bounce balls and a cane. Okay. Right, 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 right. You know, four balls down. Cane goes across the top. Left, 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 left. Mm-hmm. Cane goes across the top. Gets thrown down to my foot. Caught. You know that that took like forty-two tries. <laughs> um, so that's that's the five-ball alternating shower, you know, mm-hmm. or five-ball baby juggling pattern. Um, and then you know you can play with the one. Um, mm-hmm. So. Back to your question, to do a fractional pattern of, say, an eight-ball pattern. So I, one of the, the, the video that you posted um, a week and a half ago or so was 8-8, eight, 8-8, eight, 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 zero, zero, okay? And I do the eights as a wimpy crossing pattern, so the proper way to side swap them would be they're in pairs bracketed together. So the eight eights are together and there's another eight eight and then there's another eight eight, three pairs, mm-hmm. and then zero zero. So that so if this were a full eight eight a full eight ball pattern, it would be pair, 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 pair. Mm-hmm. Pair, 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 right? Yep. But instead I'm doing pair, 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 and then I have a zero. So that I'm I'm getting rid of three pairs and I have a an open space. Mm-hmm. I consider that to be a fractional eight pattern because the speed of the pa- of the of, and the gap between the th- tosses is as though I was doing eight. And the way that I check that is I have an ear, so I can tell mm-hmm. dot, 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 and dot, 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 mm-hmm. and dot, 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 and, you know, and I know the difference between that, which is eight, and dot, 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 dot which is seven. Right. I know that difference. Okay. Right? Um, the first one is with eights. The second one is with seven. I, you know, I could, I could give you the rhythm variations of three balls traveling through a three ball pattern, four ball pattern, five ball pattern, six ball pattern, seven ball pattern, eight ball pattern, nine ball pattern. I know what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. I know what the gap sounds like. Um, in So I call it a fractional eight ball pattern because the six balls that are traveling are occupying spaces that would have been eight balls in that pattern. Right. And, I, and I was using it as a fractional, as a training pattern to get the hand speed and the turnaround in the top mm-hmm. up to eight, eight. Mm-hmm. And 
So now you have you have this problem with an eight ball pattern. You want to be really really fast. So you have to get the ball executed and thrown really quickly. But mm -hmm. while you do that, you don't want to put extra throw, extra force on the ball so that it's over right. that it bounces too high on the return. So it's kind of the opposite of Bruce Lee. We're not developing a one inch punch with super kinetic energy. We're developing a super fast throw with not too much right. kinetic right. energy. We're actually you move your hands, you move the ball to, mm -hmm. so the ball has gone to some place which is not where it should be to be thrown. You very rapidly throw it to throw, move it to throwing position. You give it the short burst of energy which has exactly the right mm -hmm. timing and height in it, and then you do nothing more than that. Mm -hmm. That reminds uh, me of, uh, I, I grew up playing the harp, and uh, in the harp, you, you, it's, it's probably like this on other instruments where you pluck strings. I just don't play any other instruments where I pluck strings. But the, the attack idea of the string, it's the attack. Right. So you, you, you want exactly quick, the right hard. tone. Yeah. 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 I'm a classical guitar player, so it's, uh, it's. I'm sorry. I'll let you. I'll let you talk. Go. No, go that ahead. was all. I was... Yeah. So you got it. You got to get to the string on time, but you don't. You want to pluck the string with the right amount of volume, right? Either something is, you know. Um, piano or, or forte, depending upon what you want for the sound, right? And if, if you're playing a multi-voiced stringed instrument, the, the lead voice, which is playing the melody, is louder. It's plucked louder, but it may, you know, depending upon the speed, you don't want to screw up your dynamics mm -hmm. with, with your tempo, mm -hmm. right? Your tempo execution. So you have the same thing. You can think of bounce struggling as dy dynamic. I don't want to add too much speed, too much height to the force or height to the ball. Yep. When, when I'm when I'm coaching somebody new, and one of the videos you can see, I'm, I'm bounce juggling. There's a video which is me and Zach Wagner each doing a four, five ball force bounce. Now, Zach is an excellent musician. He's a cello player uh, and, uh, and also a piano player and comes from a family of musicians. He's an excellent musician. Um, you know, I would tell you. Um, so um, we're, we're able to do five ball force bounce patterns at the same time in split beats. So um, we're each doing a tempo or around 280 to 290. Pum 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 percussion um, performing partner um, um, I you know who's a who's a they're both percussionists and and Broncar if you don't know him is a beatbox bounce juggler so oh, interest okay. another interesting guy for your program um, the two of them excellent excellent rhythm in fact um, I've I've been uh, mentoring um, uh, Broncar on you know parts and when we talk to each other about bounce juggling we talk in jazz beat rhythms that's the way he knows it, not it, mm -hmm. not ne not necessarily as musical notation, but as right. as you would as you would talk about it with a tap dancer. Um, hmm. um, so um, uh, uh, you know other fractional other fractional rhythms. You can take your six balls and you with a mix of sevens, twos, and zeros create different fractions of that seven pattern. So. Um, uh, seven 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 two two, which is twenty one and two. Uh, two twos is adds to twenty five. It's a five ball pattern. It's da 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 da. Right. So that would be like a if you've seen a person with a five ball cascade pattern. It's a three up pirouette. Hold your last two balls. They throw three sevens and they spin. The mm -hmm. twos they held on. The, well, you you can do that as a bounce juggling pattern. Right left right right left right left mm -hmm. right left right. Right, left, right, and and you know your gap. You hear your gap in that. Um, what one question I had, and and then I want to get back to the three kind of disciplines of juggling. To hear what that question is, you're gonna to have to wait for the second part of this interview to come out. Hope you enjoyed that interview with David Nair. It was super fun to do. Make sure you stay tuned for when the next part gets published. I also wanted to tell you about a new resource on my website, EverydayJuggler.com, called 15 Ways to Take Your Juggling to the Next Level. Really valuable document. You're going to want to download it for free at my site. All right, until next time, keep on juggling. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, be sure to support the channel. Leave a comment, like, share, and